Okay, thank you for joining us today. Um, welcome to our lecture today, our TASA lecture today on ghrelin, dementia, and neurogenerative diseases. And um, today we're privileged to be joined by Dr. Awena Morgan, and she lectures um, on our range of medical sciences degrees, and also responsible for Welsh provision to all of our undergraduate degrees as well. Um, she's also been an academic mentor for the past seven to eight years. And um, so I'm really privileged to be joined by Dr. Wenna Morgan today and over to you. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Good morning, so not good morning, good afternoon to you all. Uh, it's a privilege to be here amongst you and to deliver this taster lecture. So what I'm actually going to do is play a, a pre-recorded lecture that I've recently recorded. Um, this will enable me to interact with you live as well on the chat. So if you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to, to ask me in the chat anything, whether it's about the presentation or whether it's about our uh, degree schemes, I will be there to help on try to answer the best I can, okay? So I'm going to share screen now. And hopefully you should be able to start seeing it. Hello there, my name is, is Dr. Olwena Morgan and I am a senior lecturer based in Jeff Davis's research group based at Swansea University Medical School. So this has uh, an interest in the involvement of, of a stomach derived hormone called ghrelin in neurogenesis and neuroprotection and today I will show you how ghrelin might generative disease particularly Parkinson's disease. So dementia, a general term for difficulties with thinking, problem solving or language and it tends to develop when the brain becomes damaged, for example, as a result of strokes or diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's or frontotemporal dementia. Now, there is currently no cure for dementia and no treatment to delay disease progression. Neither has a biomarker been identified to aid with the diagnosis or development of therapeutic targets of neurodegenerative diseases. So Parkinson's disease in, in, in particular is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder, which is most commonly known for affecting neurofunction. So symptoms include a tremor or shaking, slowness of movement, muscle stiffness, and problems with walking. It's caused the following a degradation of neurons in the substantia nigra within the basal ganglia. So this is an area within the brain that turns thought about movement into action. Now the death of these neurons causes a deficiency in the chemical messenger that is responsible for the transfer of this signal called dopamine. Therefore, this reduction leads to the motor impairments. A large proportion of Parkinson's disease patients also develop dementia, and this can be classified as either Parkinson's with dementia or PD with Lewy bodies, depending on when the symptoms of dementia emerge in comparison to the motor symptoms. Neurodegenerative diseases have two main common characteristics. The first, there is a loss of neurons, but sensory or cognitive systems. The second is that there is a correlation between metabolic changes and neurodegeneration. Even stronger evidence linking neurodegeneration to metabo metabolic regulators is the established link between Alzheimer's disease and insulin resistance. Um, so it has been reported that people with type 2 diabetes have a much higher risk of getting Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia. Now, diets such as calorie restriction will affect metabolic regulators. So calorie restriction without malnutrition has been shown to have beneficial effects uh, with regards to promoting longevity. And it also improves brain health. 
calorie restriction has also been shown to improve cognition in humans. And it's also been shown to trigger the birth of new neurons in the hippocampus. However, the big question is, what is the mechanism underlying calorie restriction induced neuroprotection and neurogenesis? As this effects, effect seems to occur during calorie restriction, it seems reasonable to assume that metabolic regulators in the body that are altered in response to the diet might also play a positive uh, a role in these positive effects of calorie restriction. So far, only one gastrointestinal hormone is elevated during calorie restriction, and this is called acyl ghrelin. Calorie restriction or fasting triggers the upregulation of ghrelin, which is what we call an orexigenic hormone. So it gets you to consume food uh, and makes you feel hungry. So at first, a pre-pro-ghrelin peptide is synthesized, which consists of 117 amino acids. Post-translational modification can generate either ghrelin or obstatin, which is a separate hormone. So ghrelin in its native form is called unacylated ghrelin or UAG. And this has to undergo enzymatic modification by an enzyme which is called ghrelin oacyl transferase or GOAT to generate the active form which is known as acylated ghrelin or acyl ghrelin AG. This involves the addition of an eight carbon fatty acid onto the third serine of the amino acid backbone and this acylation step is essential for its binding and activation of its receptor growth hormone secretagogue receptor or GHSR. And this can lead to a range of effects, including hunger, increased uh, growth hormone secretion, increased adult hippocampal neurogenesis, cognition and neuroprotection. Ghrelin can also stimulate gastric acid secretion and motility. And as issues in gastric function and, and motility are often reported in patients with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, this fits in with the theory that ghrelin regulation may be impaired during these diseases. Ghrelin itself is not considered to be expressed by the brain, suggesting that any protein that's identified there is possibly de uh, derived from a peripheral source or from the blood or it could have been synthesized enzymatically locally. So by this, I mean unisolated ghrelin might, might arrive in the brain, which can then be converted to acyl ghrelin. Now, in support of this, ghrelin itself has actually been shown to cross the blood-brain barrier. More recently, work carried out by our group has confirmed the presence of the ghrelin receptor in uh, the primary motor cortex, the dendrite gyrus of um, the adult mouse brain. And it's also been identified in, the nether, uh, in, in a range of locations within the brain. Work by our group has also confirmed the presence of GOAT, so that the enzyme that is responsible for the isolation of ghrelin in the human hippocampus and the substantia nigra, which is indicated here in purple by the arrowheads. So this supports uh, the theory that ghrelin detected in the brain could also have been synthesized locally. So just to complete the ghrelin cycle, acyl ghrelin can also undergo uh, a deacylation back into ghrelin by enzymes such as acyl protein thioresterase or butyl cholinesterase. Now, tissue expression of APT is still quite poorly characterised, but butyl cholinesterase has been shown to be expressed in the human brain and it's present in, at higher levels during Alzheimer's disease. Now, as this enzyme is involved in the deactivation of acyl ghrelin to back to its native form, the presence uh, at higher levels during Alzheimer's disease supports our theory that acyl ghrelin itself is likely to be neuroprotective. We've recently published or have been associated with published articles showing that ghrelin is indeed 
neuroprotective. And we've also shown that ghrelin enhances adult hippocampal neurogenesis and improves cognition. Okay, so our neuroscience group. Our general aims are to characterize ghrelin related components in the brain across lifespan. So this includes looking at acyl ghrelin, unacylated ghrelin, the receptor GHSR, and then also the enzymes involved in the acylation and deacylation, which includes GOAT and uh, APT1. We want to show that ghrelin is neuroprotective and that it can trigger neurogenesis and whether ghrelin can restore normal brain function during neurodegeneration. We also want to characterise those molecular pathways that underlie the ghrelin-mediated neuroprotection and neurogenesis as a means to develop new therapies. So in the laboratory, we use a variety of tools to carry out our research. We do a lot of in vitro work. So this um, is very important to look at the mechanisms and the effects that occur at a cellular level. We have mouse cell lines and also we've got human and rat primary neural stem cells. And through various collaborators, we have access to both uh, mice and rats, uh, to which um, we either treat them with or without ghrelin, or we, we put them through different feeding patterns, including calorie restriction. We also have access to mice uh, where genes for either ghrelin, goat or GHSR have been knocked out. We've also got access to uh, models of, of Parkinson's disease in mice and also models of both Alzheimer's disease and frontal, frontotemporal dementia. So in addition to these, we've also got access to human samples, uh, including uh, plasma from control, Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's disease with dementia patients, and also uh, brain sections from a range of Parkinson's, Parkinson's dementia, Alzheimer's disease, um, so we've got brain sections and also uh, plasma from all of these types of patients. So now I'd like to show some more recent results from our group, starting with the characterization of the receptor GHSR in the human brain. Now, to investigate GHSR expression in the brain, we've used a technique which is called a base scope. So because traditional antibodies um, that have been developed towards this particular protein are not that good. So base scope, this particular technique, enables the direct visualization of GHSR mRNA transcripts directly on a piece of tissue such as a brain slice. So we have coronal brain sections from either control, Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's disease with dementia patients. And we've looked at whether GHSR is expressed in the aged brain or whether it's altered during disease. So here we have examples of brain, uh, brain images uh, sections that are from either control, Parkinson's or Parkinson's with dementia patients. Uh, so we've looked at one mRNA transcript called PPIB, which is a, what we call a housekeeping control. Um, and then we've also looked at the mRNA of GHSR. And all of these little tiny, tiny dots, which are indicated by, by uh, these arrows, so these little tiny red dots are locations where mRNA for either PPIB or GHSR ha have been directly detected. So these little red dots were all um, manually quantified and plotted and as follows. So this, this is all within um, the dendite gyrus. And what we found was that uh, GHSR is indeed expressed in the human brain. Uh, however, it doesn't seem to be altered during Parkinson's or Parkinson's with dementia. So for us, the, 
these results are quite interesting because they show that there is no change in the ghrelin receptor, which makes us even more convinced that alteration of acyl ghrelin or unacylated ghrelin is more likely to play a role in disease pathology. Now, in addition to investigating the effect of acyl ghrelin, our group has also been investigating the effect of unacylated ghrelin during disease. And we've recently published some data showing that UAG does seem to have an opposing effect um, to, to acyl ghrelin. For example, unacylated ghrelin seems to impair neurogenesis and memory in mice. And as a result, we believe that circulating levels of acyl ghrelin and unacylated ghrelin seem to have opposing actions on neurogenesis and cognition, and that there could be a reduction in plasma ratio of acyl ghrelin to UAG or AG to UAG ratio in humans that are diagnosed with dementia. So next I'm going to show you some human data that we've also included in this same study. So control Parkinson's and Parkinson's with dementia patients were asked to fast overnight and they were taken off any cholinesterase inhibitors for 24 hours prior to taking blood samples. So blood was taken in, in the fasted state uh, and then uh, after, at, at various time points after they consumed some food. And then we looked at um, we, we took some blood from them and we analysed that blood for acyl ghrelin and unacylated ghrelin. And what we found was that there was indeed a reduction in this ratio of acyl ghrelin to unacylated ghrelin in the Parkinson's with dementia group, which is this blue line down here. And this is in comparison to the cognitively intact group groups, which are either the Parkinson's or the control. So we also saw that cognitive impairment correlated with a reduction in the plasma ratio of acyl ghrelin to unacylated ghrelin. And interestingly, the cognitively intact Parkinson's disease group, so these are the patients that don't suffer dementia, do not have reduced acyl ghrelin levels. So this suggests that the ratio might be a novel diagnostic biomarker for human dementia. So we also have work being carried out investigating whether the plasma acyl ghrelin to unacylated ghrelin ratio could be increased um, by the use of acyl protein thioresterase inhibitors. So this would prevent this degradation of acyl ghrelin to unacylated ghrelin. So we would increase the bioavailability of this acyl ghrelin, which, is, which has all of these cognitive um, beneficial effects. So ghrelin itself is known to bind to a, a, a eight carbon containing fatty acid. However, it has also been shown to be able to bind to a range of fatty acids that, rate, that, that uh, differ from either 2 to 16 carbons. The preferential fatty acid bound to, uh, to ghrelin can be altered by direct consumption during di the diet. However, we're wondering whether the fatty acid that is bound to ghrelin can also be altered during disease. So plasma from these very same controlled Parkinson's and Parkinson's disease patients that I've just shown you have also been analysed for their free uh, 8 carbon, 6 carbon and 10 carbon fatty acid content. And what we found is that there is an increase in, in levels of the, the 10 carbon fatty acids. So this is the free fatty acids in the blood. Uh, and this is specifically during Parkinson's with dementia. However, overall, there's no statistically significant difference in the fatty acid levels overall. Therefore, analysis of the free fatty acid content in the plasma might also be considered as a potential future biomarker for Parkinson's with dementia. So we're carrying out some more investigations into this, and we're going to characterise the range of short, medium and long chain fatty acids that are present in human plasma using mass spectrometry. 
So we're also very interested in the process of identifying and comparing the fatty acids that are actually bound to ghrelin during Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's with dementia. So we call these different acyl ghrelin species. So it'll be interesting to see whether there is an alteration in that particular fatty acid that is bound to ghrelin, not during, not only during Parkinson's disease, but also during new, other neurodegenerative disorders. So our future work includes developing a, a, a liquid chromatography based mass spec method that will detect a range of free medium and long chain fatty acids that are bound to ghrelin simultaneously. So we're interested in looking at both free fatty acids and those that are bound to ghrelin and these will take different mass spectrometry techniques uh, to analyse them. We're also very interested in possibly developing uh, an LCMS or so another mass spec method that might be able to detect acyl protein diuresterase and GOAT levels in, again in human plasma. We're also wanting to characterise both free and ghrelin bound fatty acids that are present in either control or disease status samples. So we're, we're interested in Parkinson's, Parkinson's with dementia, Parkinson's dementia in the body, and you know the list will go on, Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia and even Huntington's disease. So what disease types can we get access to is the question and uh, whatever we can get our hands on we we will try to analyze acyl ghrelin in in those samples and that is it for me thank you very much for listening brilliant thank you very much so that was my talk on um ghrelin and neurodegenerative disorders and dementia thank you very much Thank you very much, Dr. Milken. Um, so if anybody's watching the, this uh, recording, um, if you've got any further questions, then um, please contact us on study at, at swansea.ac.uk and we'll be very happy to get back to you.